Hi, I am Alex Hood. I was the voice of Kenny on Beyblade, on the OG Beyblade show in the English dub, and I have been asked by the OG Beyblade community to answer some questions, because it's fun. It's a fun thing to do. I'm glad that people are still into show into the show after all these years, and uh, yeah, it's, it's fun that something you did as a kid is, uh, it, it gets reflected back and into the cosmos, into the, you know, the wonderful cultural sphere of everything. Uh, so let's let's start in with the questions. Uh, question one, I can't believe Kenny is voiced by House of Decline. It's like finding out that Joey Wheeler is voiced by Drill or something. Uh, what was the journey from voice acting to producing comics? Uh, so yeah, my, my web handle is House of Decline. I make crude comics. I make crudely drawn comics. Um, that have queer themes in them uh, occasionally, frequently. And uh, I, I was in voice acting when I was a kid and I got into it. My mom, she was, uh, she was in the theater community in, in uh, there's a pretty close knit film and TV and theater community in Canada. So I uh, sort of got into it through her and I was doing auditions and I got lucky enough to be cast as Kenny, which was nice for me because uh, I, Canada, we got Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball super early. So I was like raised on that stuff since I was like five years old. And so yeah, thrilled to be dubbing an anime, wonderful. Um, and I love doing it and uh, it was great for a time, but there's a certain, uh, I was too neurotic for acting um, because sometimes you see yourself on screen uh, or sometimes you see yourself on TV or you hear yourself and you get sort of like a weird meta contextual aspect to it. Uh, I the, the way I would describe it is one time I was watching that movie, uh, kick ass, the movie kick ass, which was shot in Toronto. Um, and there's a scene, I was watching it in a, the Scotiabank theater. And there's a scene where they walk out of the Scotiabank theater in the movie. And it was a very like, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, my brain, you know, it was depleting because of that meta contextual moment. And that's sort of what it felt like when I would, you know, be flipping around channels and suddenly catch myself. I think, you know, you there's no good reason to be bothered by this. This is the like a me neurosis, but that's what, what sort of got me out of it. Um, I, I got into it again. I started doing like podcasting as a COVID boredom project uh, and slowly got used to the idea of, you know, this, I, I've since gotten over this neurosis just from compulsively podcasting as a COVID boredom project. But in between then, I tried to be a lawyer, which did not work out. I, <laughs> I did not have the the seriousness of spirit. That's a whole other story. I could gloss over that. But um, I, yeah, there, there was just, you know, a sort of a desire to fade into the background after ha having a sort of like weird neuroses about the, the meta contextual aspect of seeing yourself or hearing yourself on TV. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wanted to have a serious, a real job for a while, which is uh, why I went to law school. I have my law degree. It's not using that. I'm using my music bachelor's degree, my my silly arts degree from my dumb liberal arts college way more than I'm using my law degree at this point. So it's not always a useless investment. I don't, I don't know. It's the, the arts degree paid more dividends than the law degree. So some, I would, sometimes, sometimes, you know, it works out circuitously. Yeah, but I, I wasn't fit out for a lawyer. I, I had I still had that sort of artist or performer spirit in me where it's like, I want attention on me. You know, I, I want to be the one who is basking in the glory of other people's commentary. You know, I, I, I recognize that in myself because that's what you sort of have to be as an artist a little. You have to have a little narcissism because you're like, I am, I am the one to express the feelings of the masses. I am the one to expose the truth behind the veil of reality. <laughs> a little, little touch of narcissism. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and I, I think, yeah, after I sort of realized that lawyering wasn't for me, um, there was this 
crisis of, you know, what do I do? And I picked up podcasting as a COVID boredom project with my friend. And then I started just drawing comics as a further COVID boredom project. And it was something that I had always done since I was a kid, but made, you know, made no serious attempt at, you know, putting stuff out there. I didn't think I was good enough. I couldn't do no XKCD. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't perform at as high a level as the Perry Bible Fellowship. But, you know, um, I was actually seeing a lot of th this strange new wave of, of web comics that were coming up on Twitter that felt different or they had a little bit more of a, an edge to them. There was a, a Beanie Tuesday and, you know, Yolo Swag Studio, my buddy Yolo Swag Studios. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 some of that was like, well, you can maybe maybe there is something a place for a certain type of sensibility that there wasn't before in, in web comics and everyone was just picking them up. There were so many COVID boredom web comic projects. Uh, the wonderful Leslie and Brianne uh, by Keith John Stack was a, uh, a COVID boredom project. So yeah, you know, that stuff, the uh, being inside all the time and getting really insular, you know, something that I already was, you know, I, and I don't want to do that thing. Well, I'm an introvert, you know, so COVID was nice for me. You know, that's, I don't want to gloat about that, but it was like, how, like I, at the time when I was working, there was just, you know, work had slowed down a lot. So there was just time and you couldn't go anywhere. So I just did cartoons, you know, and uh, <laughs> I don't know, you just do something enough and sometimes it, it works. I don't know. <laughs> or you find a thing that you're slightly good at and you roll with it, you know? <laughs> and and uh, that's what life is all about. You know, finding something that you're kind of good at and then investing time into it. And if you can do that, then you're golden. Okay, that was a long answer, but it was a fairly circuitous journey. Number two, I'd like to know if Alex had a particular favorite Beyblade and if you guys played Beyblade in between recording, uh, I'd also like Kenny to know I used to wish I sounded like him and that his voice to me, uh, one of the most memorable and comforting VA works of my child. That's very sweet. You're very sweet. I wish I could. I wish I could. I can't. I'm so, so I'm so sorry. Puberty. You know, that's that's why it took me out of the game. I could no longer do the Kenny. But this is what Kenny sounds like now. I'm all I'm all messed up, kid. <laughs> um uh favorite Beyblade the Beyblades that I had so I I had all the original series of Beyblades but they gave us some for for free as part of working on the show um so I got uh I don't know what the the Japanese names of them are but I got the Dragoon and the Dronzer and the Drasil and the uh what was Ray's one called the oh, I don't remember what Ray's one was called. Forgive me, OG Beyblade. I'm, I, I like Beyblade, but I am not. I haven't seen the show in 20 years. <laughs> you have to forgive. So bear with me on this. Bear with me on this. I, I'm sorry. I can't remember Ray's Pit Beast. <laughs> but I, I remember Dronzer because that was the one that I, I liked. The blue of Kai's Beyblade. I thought, you know, it had the, you know, I preferred it to the turtling one of Max's Beyblade. The... For some reason, the OG Dragoon one, which you'd think would be like the least flimsy one uh, because it's the the flagship baby, it had a really flimsy quality to it. Like the Dronzer could reliably beat it if, if I'm remembering correctly. But um, me and the uh, other voice actors, we all recorded separately. We didn't record in the same room. So uh, we, and sometimes uh, when we'd get together, like at the end of a season, we'd have like a cast party and they, they'd set up a, a base stadium and they'd, we'd, we'd have some, you know, a little, a little Beyblade tournaments, you know, uh, a little Beyblade tournament or, or whichever. Um, but that was the extent of it. Um, I did play a lot with my friends, though. You know, we, we, it was a, a, a big thing, not a big thing, but, you know, a thing for a while for us in 2000. 2003 about 2001 to 2003 why well, i can't can't remember these dates so it's, it's all in the past it's all in the past but yeah we we would uh, that would be a frequent activity between us and it was a nice uh bonding activity because it's like um there's an intoxicate like i mean the show is a sports show it's a hajime no ipo you know style you know they there's a billion you know sports shows and but what's great about sports is that intoxicating 
uh, mixture of skill and luck where it's like, you can be the best football team in the world, but you just get a bad bounce and then you lose the game, you know? And it's that sort of agonizing and frustrating. And that I feel like that's, I don't follow a lot of the, like the real life Beyblade tournaments, but I imagine that sort of like, there is like a, a skill ceiling, I, I imagine, where it's like the amount you uh, pull the the rip cord and like the strength and the positioning with which you do it actually probably does has a have a material effect on how you do in the match. But you could get a bad bounce, and you know that's it for you. So I imagine that sort of like, and that that's what it was. Uh, that's why the game is the the real life game is very addictive because there is like you you do try and learn to do things that have certain skill or like even in the show even in the very first episode they say that uh, uh i think the innovation is uh, uh tyson gets a bigger rip cord so he's able to use more uh, torquing force or get or something like that there's 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 something like, but there is i i feel things that you can do to actually make uh and that is why, you know, there are Beyblade tournaments to this day. Uh, apparently they're huge. Apparently it's a gigantic thing. The show is bigger than ever, but uh, it's not OG Beyblade anymore. They, like now they're like in, in, in freaking space. And like, uh, <laughs> it's like, there's the time Beyblades. I don't know. I haven't followed it, but it's gotten very elaborate from what I understand. Uh, question three. Uh my question for the VA uh, for Kenny is, would you have liked to have seen Dizzy and Kenny battle more? Also, would you have liked to see Dizzy have a proper physical form like Dragoon and the rest did? Yeah, I think there's some part of me that would have liked to have seen that. Uh, Kenny gets to battle once, I think, with Hopper or Einstein, they call it. They sort of exchange names for the, for the Beyblade Kenny uses in the show. But... Um, I think the reason why I would, I, I like that Kenny didn't fight. I like that he was sort of, um, he, he was in a technical capacity because I think he represents a type of person. If it is a sports show, there is a type of person that loves sports and is good at sports and has something to contribute to the team, but is not himself athletic you know i think that's a lot of us you know i think there are people who are even in like things that sort of resemble sports but are skill-based activities like speed running you know there's uh somebody that executes like a speed runner at a very high level but then there are task people or there are people that go into the code of the game in order to find out you know skips that would have been very difficult to find out through trial and error alone and those people are just as important to the the records of the people that execute as as well they are naturally in a background position and that's a struggle for kenny throughout the show he sort of sometimes he does feel devalued because you know he's he's not the one who's getting the glory of actually being the athletic sports person but i think that's the lesson throughout the show is you know many episodes that center around him are about how he is integral to the functioning of the team and that he uh, has uh, a, a very uh, as, as in the first season I think this is more of a theme but I, I, I remember the second and third seasons less but um, yeah uh, yeah I, I think the uh, I think there's a point to Kenny not fighting and that it's if you're a person that you know has an alternate way to contribute to your activity community then you are valuable as well. And so if Kenny fought more that, or if he did uh, Beyblade battles more, I think that would sort of uh, in a way defeat the purpose of his character. Um, and in forms of Dizzy having a physical form, that would be interesting. I would, I want to know what Dizzy's physical form would it be because uh, Kenny had hoppers and maybe, maybe she is a frog. Uh, who, who knows? It could, could be whimsical, but I also think it's interesting that, uh, like D dizzy is uh you know uh, it's the only sentient bit beast yeah dizzy's the only uh, probably there are probably more there are probably some i'm forgetting i'm sure there's like a maybe a bit beast in future seasons with that can communicate directly with uh uh the the humans but uh i always thought that was interesting aspect to dizzy's character right she has sentience she has the ability to communicate with language. She has rationality. She is combined with a computer program, but she sort of 
lacks a physical form in exchange for sort of rationality or a type of thought or agency uh she is robbed of physical form and you know in in that way mirrors kenny's struggle as being a background character that is nonetheless you know given this superior ability to understand the underlying game so no i i really like how the character functions as a non-fighter in the in the sort of greater theming of the show um but yeah, of course, you know, you want to be like, I'm the battler, you know, I, I'm the one that won the battle. <laughs> you know, that, there is a part of me, of course, that is you, uh, Dizzy, she's like, she's like a gigantic, beautiful frog. And she's like fighting, you know, uh, you know, that would be great. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I did like Kenny's function in the show. Uh, four, is he ever going to come back to the voice acting industry? His work has been one of the most iconic in the primary of anime and cartoon entertainment. Ah, you're sweet. You're very nice. Um, I only did one anime, I think. I can't remember anything else. Beyblade was the only anime I did. Um, I did Arthur. I was on Arthur, which was, that was that was great too, because lots of people have very fond memories of Arthur, especially the era that I was in um, uh, before they moved to Flash animation. Not that the Flash animation was bad, but you know, those those original cell animated Arthurs, they look, they look real nice. And so I was glad to be uh, part of the tail end of those um but uh i i think i would maybe return to the voice acting industry i like i really like doing comics and comics take a lot of they take a lot of work you know i podcast a lot because that's you know the the house of decline handle started as a as a podcast it started me and my buddy steven were just as i said before covid boredom project and we're like we're pretty funny we're all the banter we're having on whatsapp we'll put this on the internet and that people will lack our banter and eh, maybe <laughs> it's fun. I, you know, pod, it's obviously embarrassing to be a podcaster. You know, oh, have you listened to my podcast? You know, <laughs> but if you like making little radio shows with your friends, it's great fun. I encourage people to do it. It's also great because you have a document of uh, stuff that you thought. It's like keeping a little journal as well. And I, I, you, I think people should keep a little journal because I think externalizing your emotions is always sort of healthy you know getting them out there uh because if they're just roiling around in your head you know they sort of uh you're, you're like is this normal do these have power over me but once you talk them out you know then you're then you're like oh no you know i can i can control my i can control how i feel you know so yeah podcasting has been very fun for that um so maybe i'll get back into it i like i like doing wacky voices clearly I like doing a lot of crazy voices, <laughs> but um, yeah, going through the process of like getting an agent and going to auditions and getting rejected from auditions. You know, another thing of the metal you have to have as an actor is you have to be basically okay with being meat. You know that they call it a cattle call. That's what also you know it messes with you. You'll see. You'll see in like a, a TV show about like an actor woman who goes to an audition and she sees, oh, there's a million other girls here that look like me. But that happened to me as a kid, too. You know, I have like this this like wide eyed child, you know, who's like talks in like a nerdy little high pitched articulate voice. And they got like a little a million other little me's here. It's just like I feel weird. <laughs> this is weird that there's like a bunch of me out there and they're all going for the same role, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think to, and you know, being an actor obviously is more than just me, but that's what I'm saying is like, you have to not be weirded out by some of the more meta contextual aspects of acting. Um, so maybe, yeah, I'd come back to the voice acting if they'd have me, if they offered me a part, if someone just like offered me a role on like smiling friends, of course I'd, you know, jump at the opportunity, but, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so uh, uh, may, uh, I, if, they, if they had me, I'm not going to make any serious efforts to go back to the voice acting industry. But if someone offers me a role, I won't turn it down. Five, what is his favorite Kenny moment? And what was his favorite Beyblade related memory? Uh, I'm so excited to hear his answers. OMG. Uh, favorite Kenny moment. This might be a disappointing answer because it's not a particularly good episode of Beyblade. <laughs> It's it's uh, probably one that people a lot of skip o uh, skip over a lot because it's the clip show episode. Um, but I like that episode. 
because it, it feeds my ego because within that episode, um, I, I feel it establishes Kenny as the protagonist of the, this true protagonist of the series, or we understand in that episode that Kenny is the narrator and uh, we are seeing things from his perspective in the series. And it has my favorite Kenny moment where it, it's a, it's a bit in the, I, I like any moment where like a child walks into a bar and then orders like a milk or something like hard liquor. Like they do it. That's a gag in the Simpsons that it happens at Babe. Like Kenny walks into a bar and like a, like a Columbo, he's like in a ruffled Columbo style trench coat it's like give me I forget exactly what he orders but he he orders like a milk or something and and he's like give me give me milk on the rocks <laughs> and, and I think that's my favorite moment because I, I just love that I love that gag um that or um uh I or that or like a I think my favorite Beyblade related memory was finding out about how censorship works as well. And just thinking about that, because there's one sequence in the first season where uh, we're going through the Europe and they're, they're fighting the monster squad. You know, the I, I forget they're, yeah, but they're the monsters. They got the monster bla Beyblades, you know, Cenotaph, one's called Zomb. I think I forget what the Dracula and the like Sanguinex and there's, there's a Frank, I, I don't know, but um, so, uh, there, there's a sequence where they're, they're being chased by the monster squad and they get a bazooka fired at them, but they had to edit out uh, one where they're, they're shooting a pistol at Kenny. <laughs> and it was, I like this moment. It's like, wow, Kenny's going through some real stuff right now. He's getting shot at. He's getting bazooka at. And it was like, it was funny how they described we can keep the bazooka in we'll keep the like standards and practices says we can keep the bazooka in but we had to edit out the pistol because kids might get their hands on a pistol that's too realistic it's okay to have this incendiary rpg being launched at this tiny child <laughs> but but you know we can't uh, yeah a six chamber revolver that's too real <laughs> you know so, so i think and just when I, learning about how standards and practices worked at 11 was extremely funny to add it just it just you know broke my brain in a very funny way huh had to edit out the whole sequence where kenny's getting shot at with a revolver um that is one of my favorite memories but in for a more like sentimental memory i loved playing beyblade with my friends it's a great bonding exercise it was you know beyblade smash bros melee smash bros melee you know 2001 my chemical romance <laughs> i didn't listen to a lot of my chemical romance what was i listening to in 2000 franz ferdinand <laughs> beyblade <laughs> early og 2000s core you know <laughs> um doing a lot of that stuff um but yeah, as a as just a bonding exercise, just you know, doing little tournaments with my friends, you know, if that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's about you know trying to get slightly better at something in this game. That's this maddening combination of skill and luck, where you can do things to get better, and sometimes you're on a roll. Sometimes, like five times, you won in a row, and your friends like, this sucks, this I hate you. And, <laughs> And that's, that's the magic, baby. You know, it's, it's, you know, getting into that friendly uh, competition with your friends, the, the striving to not like real competition, like real competition is bad. And, you know, you shouldn't try to diminish other people in order to get ahead of them. But in like a scenario where you are sort of friendly rivals with somebody and you're striving to get better at something together by competing at something, and you're still remaining friends all throughout. That's that's what it's all about. That is the the heart of sportsmanship. And that is or what I mean. <laughs> I I think I imagine this community probably acknowledges Beyblade as a sport, but <laughs> but I, I I feel other people might balk at that. But it is. It's a physical thing. You might say it's a skill thing. Is speed running a sport? I don't know. I, I I'm not going to get into this debate. For this community, I imagine that uh, it's a it's a sport. So I'll, I'll call it that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the, the show is a sports anime, too. So it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a sport for the purposes of the fantasy and also the reality. Um, so uh, 
please, please ask you, uh, when, when will the original, this is number six, when will the original series come and will they give a uh, voice or work for it? We miss Beyblade OG them as well. I don't know if the, I have no control over the original series coming back. I, I would be cool if it did. Uh, they do some sort of thing where they got uh, it's Tyson and Kai and they're all old and rugged now, you know, or uh, maybe they do like a redux version, like Evangelion, they do Beyblade rebuild, you know, it's like we got some parts of the series, right? But we ran out of budget and others, and now we want to do like a saucier version. We're going to do a saucier version. Um, if they asked me, I would do it, absolutely. But yeah, I have threats. Uh, I don't have I don't have control over that. Um, if I, 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 as far as I understand, uh, OG Beyblade is popular, but like the thing that's really popular with Beyblade is like the new stuff where like the designs of the characters get like crazy elaborate and they're in space and everything is whooshing around. And like, that's like what people are, that, that that's like the, the more, uh, popular iteration of it, but, uh, maybe, as people develop nostalgia for more nostalgia for OG Beyblade, uh, as I'm sure will happen, and they enter the media market and get more spending power, uh, there will uh, Hudson or whoever produces it. <laughs> Hudson Soft? No, that was who produced the, the games. Who produced the I don't know, Bandai? It wasn't a Bandai. I don't know who produced But whoever, whichever company is in control of them, maybe as, as the nostalgia gets more real, uh, it'll come back but i cannot say seven uh it's another do you think old beyblade would ever come back what if you did a short ova or something and featured a multiverse where old characters come back in the new generation would you voice can yeah i i would but yeah i think that because now we have all space beyblades and we have like time beyblades and what if kenny is like you know they find kenny at the end of the universe or something He's, you don't want to you don't want any piece of this kid I created a Beyblade so powerful, it destroyed the universe. <laughs> they have to like go through time undoing the apocalypse Beyblade that Kenny created. And then finally, like, finally I can rest because you want to. And you know, it's like Dizzy went, they do it like a super gritty <laughs> Beyblade. Dizzy went and said she, she couldn't take being unsentient anymore. So she gained a physical form and uh, manifested herself throughout the galaxy as the apocalypse Beyblade. And, you know, it's, you don't want, kid, I did the wrongest thing on earth. I kept a bit beast trapped. And you know the punishment for keeping a bit beast trapped? The end of the world. <laughs> the end of the universe. So, yeah, a, a gritty Beyblade OVA featuring all the old kids. And they have to, like, revive, like, an, there's an old gritty Tyson and an old gritty Kai, and they're first at odds at one another again, but they rediscovered their wonderful friendship. And uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, who knows? Um, do you still have Kenny's voice? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you say one of your favorite lines from Beyblade using Kenny's voice, please? Uh, I don't know if I remember any individual lines from Beyblade. Uh, let's let's see. Let's look up um, something on the Beyblade Wikipedia uh, and see if there are any choice quotes from Kenny on the Beyblade Wikipedia and see if I can approximate my child voice. Um, uh, Kenny, known as Manabu Seian, Se Seian Chief Kyoju, Kyoju I, yeah, I'm getting, butchering the Japanese pronunciation. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm butchering the Japanese pronunciations. Uh, good old Chief. Uh, what are what are quotes? Give me some, give me some quotes, Beyblade Wiki. Uh, Trivia. Oh, I'm I'm in the trivia. That's funny. It has it has my trivia in here. It says in the trivia section, Alex Hood, voice actor for the English dub, stated in interviews that Kenny's personality is similar to himself in real life. Also due to Hood hitting puberty, Kenny's voice is deeper in the third season. At the great, thank you, puberty tracking, <laughs> puberty tracking, Beyblade Wiki. <laughs> Oh my, oh mercy. Um, unfortunately, they don't have any, it doesn't seem like they have any Kenny quotes that I can rely on. Oh, here we go, right at the top of the page. Let's see if I can approximate my child voice. Around here, they call me the chief. They call me the chief because I'm an expert on Beyblading. I can't, I can't do it, folks. It's not gonna work. 
It's not happening. Maybe it'll be season three. <laughs> Diminished puberty, Kitty. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, mercy. Th- thank you. Thank you, wonderful Beyblade Wikipedia people. Um, it's the 29, nine. It's the 25th anniversary of Beyblade. Do you have any message for the hardcore fans who still cherish the memories of OG Beyblade TV show and Beyblade fans in general? OG Beyblade page admins. Thank you, OG Beyblade page admins, for uh, 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 reaching out to me. This is very fun. Uh, if I have a message, it's uh, I think the you know Beyblade. It's a show that starts out as a show to sell toys. You know, we, we're going to be honest, right? Um, it, it's, you, you know, you want to sell the tops, so you make an engaging program about, you know, why the tops are cool. And it did that effectively. But I think even within um, these sort of marketing animes, you know, even Pokemon was a marketing anime to some. Digimon was, I mean, Digimon was interesting because Digimon gets really, season three goes really hard for no particular reason. Uh, so these things that sort of start out as marketing entities, um, you know, they take on a sort of, especially Beyblade. I think the reason why it's so popular now is because there is an emotional core to it. Like what I was describing with Kenny earlier, or even, you know, uh, Tyson's arc overcoming his impatience and hot headedness, Max overcoming his passivity, uh, Kai overcoming, uh, you know, his traumatic, awful, horrible, traumatic childhood. Uh, Ray reckoning with his past and his failed relationships. You know, these are all heady arcs. You know, these are all, these are things that you can relate to emotionally and draw on in your life to uh, sort of enrich it in a way. And I I think that's beyond the fact that Beyblade battles are cool and the designs are cool and, you know, you like playing the game itself. I think there is something that uh, emotionally gets to people about these characters. And, And what you learn about, throughout the show is uh is you know the classic anime shonen you know sports anime stuff of friendship and you know looking out for one another and your nakama and you know you are ultimately enriched by community and not just community craft if you can find something where if you have a skill that you can get better at and not only can you get better at you have a group of people where you can get better at it with in, in like a friendly competition where you all love each other and you love each other because you're all performing at such a high level and uh, you inspire each other to be better at the thing that you enjoy doing. I think that's, that's what you take away from the show. Um, I think that is the most positive emotional message that you can learn from this. Uh, this. Uh, so thank you once again for having me OG Beyblade community and uh, have a beautiful day.